I'm too sexy for my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> yes, best intro ever. <laughs> you didn't know I was going to do that. <laughs> no, I love it. <laughs> that is, I've done so many podcasts and that is the best intro ever. <laughs> nice. Oh, I, I love being, hey, if I, if I can make your day or be in the you, if this oh, podcast fantastic. is memorable for the first 20 seconds, that's good, man. I love it. Yeah. Tanner, dude, welcome to Dad Edge. <laughs> Thanks for having me on, Larry. I'm stoked to talk about this with you, dude. I am too. I am too. I, I want to give the audience, I mean, obviously they heard all about you in the intro and that kind of thing. And, and, uh, just some of the fascinating things, uh, about our style, right. And as dads, and I think, man, it's safe to say, and I'm guessing here, you know, more than I do. Well, when we get married and we start having kids and we have a career and all this other stuff, I mean, you know, my style, like it just really takes a back burner. It's not a priority, right? right. You find that quite often. Oh yeah. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I think that's kind of the standard trope and and most dads do go that way where it just becomes, it, even if you're assuming it was a priority at some point, let alone something that they were just kind of haphazard about, haphazard about before, but for most dads, it's, it's not anywhere near the top of the totem pole as far as priorities are concerned. Yeah, man. Yeah. I, 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 quick movie reference. Um, have you ever seen the movie crazy, stupid love? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I, oh yeah. <laughs> I have to, yeah. I have to think, man, that, you probably watched that movie where for those of you guys who haven't seen it, um, it's it's definitely not just a chick flick. It is highly entertaining. Yeah. You it's got a fun Ryan, one. Yeah, you got Ryan Gosling, who's like, he's the single guy, he's very stylish, knows his style, wears really you know, knows everything about it. Then you've got um Steve Carell. Steve Carell. I once called him Michael Scott. Right. And yeah, and he plays like he's recently separated, almost divorced. You know, he's been a dad, he's in his 40s, you know, his no sense of style whatsoever. And he's trying to get into the dating world. So basically mm -hmm. Ryan Gosling takes him under his wing and teaches him about stuff. But dude, I, he's like, he's like, Cal, man, don't wear those jeans, man. You look like you have a mom's butt in them, you know? And, yep. like, and don't wear the new, the white new balance, you know, you, yep. unless you're Steve jobs, you can't wear these. <laughs> <laughs> Be better than the gap. <laughs> Be better than the gap. Yes. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> hey, before we get started, uh, let's just start with some fun questions, man. Shoot. Um, yeah. What is something that you enjoy doing outside of obviously helping men with their, with their fashion and expressing themselves through fashion? Uh, what do you, and your five kids mm -hmm. under 10. Yeah, it's wild. Right. And this amazing wife that you talk so highly of, what do you like to do outside of the, the work obligations you have and, and die hard, busy family? So I have kind of two things that I really enjoy. Um, one is anything fitness related, especially because. I, uh, I don't like the one dimensional stuff. I'm, I'm not an athlete, but if I were an athlete, I would try to be a hybrid athlete where it's strength training and then also endurance stuff. And I've boxed and I've done Spartan races and, uh, like big long triathlons and all of these other things. And so for me, it's trying to find the balance between building up my strength, but also doing some of these other skills. And so I love doing that. And then I also really am just kind of, I like playing video games, especially with my one son. We're, uh, we're going through Legend of Zelda right now. And uh, I like playing Fortnite with some buddies and, and stuff like that. And so I try to get the physical, but also allow myself to do a little bit of the gaming stuff too. So it sounds like you're, you really like the balance, you know, it's like, Hey, mm -hmm. I work really hard in these areas, but then I can also decompress in these. Yeah. Uh, what is uh, the toughest event you've ever done as far as like a Spartan race or a triathlon, anything like that? Boxing for sure. I had one really? amateur boxing bout. It was only three one minute rounds, but it went from kind of a nervous excitement to holy crap, this hurts way more than sparring to, I don't want to do the third round, but I have to get back in and just get it over with. <laughs> so that was the most mentally difficult thing I've ever done. And it was only three minutes, which was crazy, but yeah, definitely the toughest thing. Wow. So what happened in the second round? Oh, I got the crap kicked out of me, man. I, <laughs> I, am, I am not a good boxer and I'm old and I'm very stiff and uptight. And this guy that I fought was like 13 years younger than I was. And he was taller and he had longer reach and he was more relaxed and more fluid. And he got me in the first like 30 seconds with a right cross and basically just popped my nose open. I'm seeing stars and it was just everything I could do to try and remember the combos that I had drilled over and over and over again, to try and remember to breathe, to try and not get tied up in my feet. 
And it was really fun to not throw in the towel and just stick it out and even kind of like make a bit of a, a bit, little, little bit of a comeback in the third round. But it was, it was really tough and it was really fun that it was that tough too. In fact, I remember a, a couple years later, I'm doing this half Ironman and I'm on the bike and the wind's blowing against me. I haven't eaten because I swallowed too much water because it's stormy and it's rainy from the swim. And I'm just miserable. Like I'm about to pass out. And I just keep telling myself, this is not worse than boxing. And I use this now all the time, whether it's having to deadlift something I don't want to, or, you know, I'm it's hot and I'm doing a Spartan race and I just want to be done in the shade. I can tell myself this is not worse than boxing. And that's now become kind of like my mantra on stuff. So, wow, man, it just, a uh, and just a quick, uh, retrospect, right? So how you and I met in person, which by the way, I've, I've, I've followed you ever since I heard your first show on Mickler's podcast. Mm -hmm. And, uh, so Ryan and I talk, I would say fairly often, you know, we're always like swapping ideas around podcast guests. And I yeah. remember the first time he talked about you, I was like, really, I was like, men's style. Did that go pretty well? He's like, yeah, man, the audience, they really liked it. And I was like, okay. I was, he's like, I can get you an intro. And <laughs> this sounds terrible. But at the first, I was like, I don't know if my audience would really resonate with Tanner. I yeah, was like, I, you know what I mean? Totally. Then, I get it. But then I heard the, the podcast and I was like, oh, this is great. And then I started following you on social and I was like, man, I just, I love how authentic Tanner is. Like, he just, he's like, he is who he is. And also very, very helpful. You, you provide so much value just on your Instagram alone. I love that. And then meeting you in person, you, and this is going back to the boxing thing, you, mm -hmm. me, you and Frankie Edgar shared the speaking stage yep. at, at an event. And question I have for you is, do you have way more respect for Holy guys God. like Frankie and all these guys who box and fight for a living after your experience. Just so much more. It's, it's just insane to think about the amount of times, especially somebody like Frankie, who it's not just boxing, like the brutality of MMA in addition to it. And the amount of hours that that man has spent in the ring and he keeps going back to it. And you look at stuff like his cauliflower ear and you, you that he's earned that it's a whole different level of respect after having spent some time in the, in the ring myself. Yeah, I can, I can only imagine I've never, I've done three different types of martial arts. Um, but I've never like gone like full blown out, like in a ring or a cage mm -hmm. before, you know what I mean? But you should, you I, should, I would, it's life changing. Honest, yeah, man. I would, I would love to do something like that. Okay. So boxing by far the hardest, uh, let's get to, let's get to marriage. Uh, how okay. long have you been married? Uh, 10 years, almost 11. Wow. So you got, you, you didn't waste any time. Damn. No, like no. boom right away pretty much you yeah. got a 10 year old yeah 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 we were she just snuck in like barely under a year <laughs> yeah so we were pretty quick <laughs> yeah for sure what's been one of the so let, let's go back 11 years ago okay okay and let's just let's just uh take this situation where where you can you can have dinner with yourself the guy you are right now presently and you're going to invite 11 years ago tanner to dinner Okay. And you have an opportunity to sit down with yourself for one hour and you're like, all right, man, listen up. This is me 11 years into the future. You've been married now for 10 years. And I'm going to give you some advice. It's going to make this whole thing a heck of a lot easier for you. So that way it's going to make the next 10 years uh, just a lot easier. There's going to be less bumps in the road. There's going to be less mm -hmm. banging your head up against the wall. And here's the advice I'm going to give you. What would you tell yourself? Um, okay. I think one of the first things is that most of the world, uh, men will see marriage and fatherhood as kind of a dead weight for their own dreams and ambitions and goals. And it's not, it's rocket fuel. All of my, all of my own personal self-development has come as a result of the responsibility of being a husband and a father. And so lean into the responsibility and the expectations that come with that. Because if you, if you channel that the right way, that's what helps you become the best version of yourself. At the same time, don't get addicted to the self-development. That's one of these things that I'm tackling right now. Um, one of the things that we've been tackling for the last year is a lot of times it's very easy to focus on, well, I'm going to work on my fitness or I'm going to build my business or we're going to do this with parenting in order to avoid having to do the really kind of deep personal work of actually changing what your, what your mental models are, what your spiritual or your emotional models are. Um, the ways that I'm overly reliant on my wife for validation or that she's got frustrations with me because of these other things. And so a lot of times 
it would be do don't don't get so focused on the fitness or on the business that you use it as a way to run away from the the real work that you need to do because ultimately when when you get that dialed in that's where the real growth and the transformation comes from and then i think the third thing would be just like when you have four kids you can't drive the same car that you had when you have three kids right you have to upgrade the vehicle because you need more space and all of that or when you have six or seven kids you can't do the minivan or the suburban anymore you have to upgrade something new you have to update your mental paradigms as you introduce more kids because what worked really really well for two or three kids isn't going to work as well for four or five and that doesn't mean that it was bad or it doesn't mean that you're wrong or that you're bad but it does mean that you need to adapt and you need to change and upgrade just like you need to upgrade your home or your vehicle or something else to be able to, to accommodate having more kids come into it too. Dude, we're only 10 minutes into this podcast and I already feel like I could talk to you all day long. Like this could be like <laughs> a four hour Joe Rogan and Robert oh, man. Robert back and forth, but no, man, that, that is really, really solid advice. And I love several things I love in there. One, one in particular that a lot of people, a lot of men do use like, well, I'm married and I'm a father. So that's my crutch of not being able to do these other things. Right. And, and listen, if a man like yourself, who's high in demand, who has a, has a solid business to help helping men uh, upgrade their style, uh, not to, so the, 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 the woes, the ebbs, the flows, the success, the busyness of being a business owner, five kids under 10, right. Also, I know being married and, and keeping your marriage on point is extremely important to you just by getting to know you. And also you're able to do all these other things. Like I see you, you know, on your IG, you're always in the gym, you're always in your home gym working mm -hmm. out. Right. And I know you do that on purpose. Yeah. Uh, you, you're always making room in your life to strike, I would say. And I, I always hesitate to use the word balance, because, right. but, but I see you optimizing and balancing things and, and and doing touch points of things that are, are feeding you, right. And helping you show up as a better man, husband, and father. And I think that's critical. A lot of guys do miss the mark on that. I do want to challenge you on one thing that you said. Um, it is. Let's go. I yeah. I don't know if I agree with it. Okay. When I had to use the word upgrade for a vehicle. And when mm -hmm. I went from an SUV to a minivan, <laughs> I did not feel that was an upgrade. It did not feel like an upgrade, did it? <laughs> In fact, when I signed the papers, I'm like, yes, here is my payment and uh -huh. my testicles. Thank you. Yeah. Like, oh, I'm yeah. Like, no. <laughs> right? I hear you. We went from a BMW X3 to the minivan, and it did not feel like an upgrade <laughs> oh, at all. <laughs> nope. Right. Uh, I'll never forget, man. I was, on a, I was on a business trip, and this was before I had four kids. I only had two. Mm -hmm. And it was me and a bunch of people we worked with. We had to go to like home office, you know, to do like a quarterly business review. So we rented a minivan because we had like seven of us with us that were at the airport and we had to drive. And I was the driver and I got in and one of my friends who's in the passenger seat, he was single at the time. I was newly married and I got in. I was like, man, I was like, yeah, this, this thing's kind of comfortable. I like, actually don't drives, hate this. <laughs> right. I just drives like a car. And he like whipped around with me. He's like, do not ever say anything like that again. <laughs> don't, don't. <laughs> don't know you. <laughs> oh, isn't that so funny? But it's it's a perfect example of these kind of like little aesthetic or status cues that we as men are very finely honed in on and finely yeah. tuned into of you do, you feel like you sacrifice your testicles in order to drive a minivan. And it's not because of anything other than the perception of it being a minivan. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, but it does the job. I mean, it's it does. pretty darn convenient. Like the right. fact that I can like hit a button and the doors come open and they don't yep. hit the car next to us. I'm, I'm right. Good. And you don't have to like roll seats forward to buckle a kid in. They can get in and out themselves. And it's there, there, there are real merits to it for sure. I, okay. We're, we're going to edit this part out because we don't want this on. <laughs> oh, I can't let that right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So I, I also want to talk about the same situation. You have an hour with yourself. And well, first of all, one quick question before I get into asking you, what advice would you give yourself 11 years ago being a new, you know, not yet being a father and being now 10 years into it. But did you ever, did, did you ever see yourself being a father of five, like before you got married? Yeah, I did. Yeah. Oh, wow. Okay. Cool. Yeah. I think guys, part of it is that's part of our culture with our faith. We're right. members of the church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints known for big families. I'm the oldest of five. My wife is the seventh, sixth of seven. And so big families are still kind of like, a normal ish thing for us. And so, yeah, I totally, I totally pictured it this way. 
Okay. Okay, cool. Yeah. I'm going to ask a question that I've always been curious about. And if yeah. it's not, if it's, if it's not show appropriate, we can edit it out, but I am curious Now you say that the church of Latter-day Saints, right? So you, there's this stereotype and there's, there's a lot of realism to it that you, that you guys do have a lot of kids. I'm Catholic. Mm-hmm. You have the exact same stereotypes. Like, uh-huh. oh, you, have five, you have five kids. You're Catholic. No wonder. Right. Yeah. Um, but it, what is it about your faith and, and the number of children that you have? Um, there's a couple of components to it. I think the first one is that we believe that the first commandment that uh, God gave Adam and Eve was to multiply and replenish the earth and that that's never been rescinded. And so there is a commandment to actually propagate above the replacement level. Um, there's certainly a cultural aspect of it of, you know, to be totally honest, I think that especially you go back 20th century where it was almost high status if you had more kids. And I don't think that that's the best reason for it, but it certainly removes a lot of the cultural friction of it being low status to have a lot of kids where there was kind of this expectation here. Um, And then also so much of our doctrine is rooted around the idea of family. We believe that husband and wife are not only married here for, you know, till death do us part, but that we're married for time and all eternity, that we will be husband and wife forever, that we will be connected to our children forever and the family is the not only the fundamental unit of civilization on earth, but it's also the fundamental unit of, of the heavens. And so it's all just a kind of a propagation of that same mindset. Yeah. Does that answer that for you? Yeah, totally. Um, that really does. I, I, that definitely cools my curiosity around that. And, and the first, especially the first commandment thing, I'm like, Oh yeah, that, that really does make a whole lot of sense. Yeah. And, uh, I, I, I'm not, I, I am a diehard Catholic. I, I love my faith. And, um, but I think a lot of people outside the Catholic faith is they kind of view us as like, um, sometimes drunk, irresponsible people <laughs> you know, that, that have kids because we probably party too much or something. Right. Or contraception know. isn't allowed and you don't know how to do it any other way. Right. Right. And then there's, yeah. there's that family planning aspect too, right. Mm-hmm. Where, you know, they, they really instill like not using, um, any type of birth control or anything is family planning. So, and sometimes family, family planning doesn't really work. So, um, <laughs> but I do want to ask you, you know, five kids in 10 years. And if you did have the opportunity to share some advice over fatherhood and by the way, also g- give me the mix, uh, boys and girls. So first is a girl, second is a boy. And then all the rest are girls. So four daughters, one son, and he's number two. Yeah. Yeah. And not only that, but I grew up the oldest of five and it was the opposite. It was four boys and one girl. I have no idea. I've never been around this much girl in my entire life. I'm so out of my element. (laughs) So this is such a funny story. So literally um, this was a couple of days ago. We're in church and Mm -hmm. it's me and, and it's so funny. You walk in with four boys and people like literally look at you like, oh, you're insane. Like (laughs) you just feel the judgment, right? (laughs) But there, there was a family right next to us. And I always love seeing like the families who have like four or five, six kids. Cause you look at them and they look at you and they're like, yeah, you I, get it. I, I yep. got you. Same like, team. I, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yep. yep. But, uh, so there was this family literally that sat next to us, four girls, one boy. And I think the boy was probably second oldest from what I can okay. tell. So yeah, right where I am. Yeah. And I nudged my oldest. Right. And I was like, Hey man, I was like that family over there. He's like, yeah. he's like, he's like, Oh, He's like, that's a lot of girls. I'm like, yeah, man. I was like, look at the boy. He's like, he looks miserable. I was <laughs> like, yes, he does. <laughs> oh yes, man. He does. I mean, dude, he's this, also going to be really good with girls when it comes time to start dating. Right. He'll know it backwards and forwards. But like, mm-hmm. literally, this kid was like, my life is terrible. <laughs> like, he was your typical kid. like 13 year old oh, kid in the mix of all that. And he was that like, poor kid. kid. Um, all right. Well, Hey, I want to get into what, what we're going to talk about today. Cool. So when we were at our live event where you spoke and I spoke, Frankie spoke, I just couldn't get enough of what you were talking about. And you really did this fantastic job because I was, I was kind of being sarcastic with you, you know, just mm-hmm. you know trying to be funny and all that the night before when we were talking and I'm like, all right, man. So like, what do you, I can't remember what the question was. I was like, how do you go about like, this whole style thing. Like, I'm not really under, like you just help people pick out colors and you're like, Oh no, no, man, it's, it's deeper than that. And I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, well, you know, I get into like the whole psychology He's like, I also add in a lot of personal development in my coaching with, Mm -hmm. with men. And I was like, okay, well how so? And then he's like, well, he's like, chances are that, and you use this one example that landed with me big time. 
I was, he's like, chances are you probably wear things or things are in your closet and you wear things out of some sort of perception of yourself or some sort of psychological reason or, and then you kind of went deeper and deeper. I don't want to spoil it. You'll, you'll talk about it. But I was like, Oh my God, dude. I was like, does this explain why like my favorite color is black? Like, and I only wear black and like for the longest time, like in our community and the data Alliance guys mm-hmm. were like, Oh, Hagner, your favorite two colors are black and black. <laughs> and we really got into it. And I uh-huh. started like, you started asking me questions. And I was like, well, I was a fat kid until I was 17 and I was always so self-conscious of the way I looked and I always wore dark colors. And, and that has like, even though I'm fit now, like it's, I still view myself through that yep. lens, you know, and it's yep. hard for me. But when, when you said that, I was like, holy crap. Like I started like thinking about everything in my closet. Why do I wear it? What's going yep. through my mind before I put it on? Like when I go to a store, why do I go to the first black shirt section? <laughs> right. Yep. So yep. yeah, talk to us about some of the psychology behind how we perceive ourselves as it pertains to style. So I think one of the first things to understand is that our relationship with our appearance, especially our own style, most guys think about it as kind of like it's 90% the way that other people see me and treat me. And so, yeah. and this is why a lot of dads don't care. I'm already married. I don't need to impress my wife. I don't need to impress my kids. There's no reason for me to dress up for somebody else. And they'll think that it's like this 90, 10, 90% for other people, maybe 10% I feel comfortable or it feels like it's authentic for me or whatever else. When the reality is, is it's inverted. It's 90% rooted in our own self-perception, our own identity, our own relationship with ourselves, both what our hangups are or were and what our aspirations are and all of that. And it's only about 10% as far as what we project out to other people. And it becomes this very powerful tool to start to change the way that you see yourself or to start to reinforce other things about how you see yourself. You know, so for example, you being chubbier when you're little and you start moving to black, one of the reasons a lot of guys do that is because you were, you were a goofy kid, right? Like one of the, one of the safety catches that you play when you're the chubby kid is you're, you're the class clown. It's a way to kind of offset people making fun of you because, Hey, I'm in on the joke ahead of time and all of that, but there's not the same level of kind of like raw physical masculinity. We perceive black as having this inherent edge to it. There's this kind of danger and this edginess. And so when you put on black, it offsets that kind of goofy teddy bear, fun, friendly, nice guy, and adds an element of that kind of physical masculinity. And so it's a way for you to offset and be able to play with things that way. And that continues on because then it not only becomes something that is really easy from a comfort perspective of, yeah, I just wear black. I like black, but then it also becomes this, no, I wear black. And when I see myself in a different color, I see somebody that's different in the mirror than how I actually perceive myself. And now there's this dissonance between what I see and how I feel. And I run away from that dissonance. And so I go back to the thing it is that I've always worn because I want to be able to maintain that congruence rather than thinking about, okay, is there a way that I can make that dissonance work to my advantage so that, yeah, I I may feel differently about what I see in the mirror than I did before, but then it makes me go, oh, I can be better than what I am. I can improve what I am. I can be more than what I am. Instead, most men just kind of retreat back to what they were and they really hold on to that identity. And it's funny because they'll say things like, I don't care how I look or I'll just wear whatever's comfortable. And you challenge them on that. It's like, okay, I guarantee you that your wife's dresses are going to be physically more comfortable than what you wear. Go put those on and tell me that you still feel fine, that that doesn't change your own self-perception that you don't care how you look. If you're wearing one of your wife's dresses, of course you care. You only care to the extent that you just want to maintain that status quo and maintain that very limited self-perception as opposed to using as a tool to grow and expand beyond it. See guys, did you hear that? That was your brain exploding, right? (laughs) Now you guys got a taste of when Tanner and I were at the restaurant the night before he spoke, I was like, holy crap. Like a different world, right? Just totally yeah. opens up. Yeah. I mean, like literally, I I think I even told you that now. I was like, uh, you need to get out of my head. <laughs> like that's exactly I was the class clown. And the funny thing was, is I re- I remember bits and pieces of that conversation, but uh, you definitely refreshed it just now. But I, I was that class clown. And it mm-hmm. was because like I gotta beat people to the punch of of laughing first before they're laughing at me. Exactly. Then they're laughing with you instead yeah. of at you. Self-protective. Yeah. I don't know if you remember me telling you this story or not, but do you remember me telling you the story of the first time I went to this new school and I played baseball for the school and what the color of the team uniform was? 
No. Okay. I thought I did. Maybe I didn't. So I'll never forget this. I was in eighth grade. It was my second try at eighth grade. Cause I had to, I failed eighth grade once I had to go through it again. Okay. So and already dealing with some trepidation and everything there. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I mean, it was, it was right in the crux of like, for those of the guys who, who haven't listened to the podcast or, or just getting to know me and my story. So at that point in time, my mom had just ended her second marriage. My biological father, who I'd never had a relationship with had reentered my life for six months and then exited my life again. And so like up when I was 12 and like right in that time where I was, you know, starting eighth grade, failed eighth grade, I got to the point where I was like, I don't care about anything. Mm -hmm. And, and I just started overeating and got really, really big. And, and so the, the funny thing was, is one of the reasons I don't like white, cause I think you might've asked me, it's like, why don't you really like light colors? Do you have something you remember? And I was like, actually I do. And this sounds like I, I always look back on it. I was like, Oh, it was kind of a funny moment. Like it was really mm -hmm. a funny moment. And but then I look back on it and I'm like, it's also a pivotal moment if I really think about it. Right. So when I went to this new school, my, my first school that I would, I was, I went to and I failed our school colors were black. So mm -hmm. like my, my baseball uniform was black, which I didn't mind, obviously. Right. Then I went to this new school and they were red and white more white than red. Okay. So I put on my baseball uniform, which by the way, was probably a size or two too small. So you're already a stuffed sausage in it. Super oh, self-conscious about how you look. Right. I literally, I, I'll never forget. I was at my grandma and grandpa's house. I'll never forget the room that I was in. And I will never forget the mirror that I looked in. I looked at myself and I was like, I literally look like the Pillsbury Doughboy on the commercial. Oh, All white. The only red was like on the collar and then uh -huh. on the sleeves and my belt. That was it. Everything else was white. And I just remember looking and I was just like, oh my God, like this looks awful. That's like, brutal. Yeah, man. And I'll never forget that. I don't think I've really worn a whole lot of white. Since. Yeah. Because <laughs> think about how deeply ingrained that is because your identity then becomes, I am the fat kid and I, I'm all the bad things that are associated with it. And so you see that on you and it doesn't happen consciously, but you see that you see white on you and just go bad, 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 bad. All these kind of internal subconscious alarms start to go off. Yep. Very much so. And, you know, for this particular podcast and for the audience, we have a lot of guys out there that are probably like, you know, I'm, I'm not, I don't really see the advantage to really upgrading my style or even what I would call what I learned from your talk is actually uh, being able to express who you are as a person through what you wear. Yeah. And I, I never viewed it that way. I always viewed it as I'm going to wear colors that are, that make me feel confident and I'm going to wear clothes that are comfortable. And then I, I, I watched it, you know, the outfits that you were wearing. I was like, man, that's cool. And every day was a little different. And I was like, man, this mm -hmm. is really, really cool. And then I really started thinking, you know, what example am I setting for my boys? Boom. Right. And I never thought of that through style. Like I could literally be sending a message to my kids. I'm not comfortable in my own skin. Therefore I'm constantly going to wear clothes that I'm comfortable in. So I don't mm -hmm. have to, so I don't have, and that's how I express myself. And it's like, to be honest, the message I'm sending is I feel insecure. Yeah. 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 And, and then, you know, when I started, I, cause I, I have put different items in my, in my, in my uh, closet ever since you and I, good. ever since I met you and I noticed, so like I took my wife out on a date night and I had like this very different outfit on and my boys were like, dang. Like, dad, those colors are cool, man. I had on this bright blue shirt and I had mm -hmm. on this like sleeveless um, jacket. Mm -hmm. And then I had these dark jeans with these gray boots on. And they're like, Sweet. man, dad, like, that's a cool outfit. And I was, like, and I was like, and I was like, that's, I want to project like that message to the boys. Like, Hey, you know, express who you are, be comfortable in your own skin, be confident. Right. And I think what I was probably, you know, showcasing to them earlier was like, I wasn't. But yeah, you're just trying to hide, draw as yeah. little attention to yourself as you possibly can. Right. So yeah. talk, talk to us about that. Yeah. Well, I think that there's, there's two elements in that, that I want to hit. The first one has to do with, especially how it relates to parenthood, as far as like what the advantage of it is. Cause yeah. And we'll hit on this as we go through, cause this organically comes up. There are a lot of, lots of advantages to you as the man dressing better. But one of the big advantages to your kids is I'm sure you hit on this on the show all the time, but fatherhood is not painted aspirationally anymore in media and everything else dads are non-existent or they're dopey like homer simpson or phil dumphy and i don't know how it was for you but i know for me especially being kind of like an angsty punk rock kid in my teenage years marriage and fatherhood 
literally felt like the death of individuality. It felt like the death, the death of self-expression. It felt like the death. It just felt like suburban purgatory. It was, you just, this is where who you are as an individual goes to die. That's what fatherhood was for me. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And you're laughing because you know, right. Yeah. And part of the problem is that so many of the dads that were in my life and thankfully my dad wasn't this way. He was a little bit, but not nearly as much as, you know, some of my friends, dads or others, that's what it was for them is, they don't have hobbies. They don't, in, they don't flirt with their wives. They don't stay in good shape. They don't look like they care about their se- themselves. They're just trying to make themselves as aesthetically and physically and, and emotionally as small as they possibly can to avoid rocking the boat and to avoid dealing with anything. And that that's hell. And so what we have an obligation to do, I think we as fathers have a moral obligation to make marriage and fatherhood as aspirational and as appealing as we possibly can. So that our boys want to and become excited to leave adolescence and become men, to become grown adult men, to become husbands, to become fathers. And also because our daughters, they're going to end up marrying men that are like the example that we set. And so what's the height of the example that we're setting? And so, no, I'm not saying that if you change your clothes, that all of these other things don't matter because they absolutely do. But in addition to taking care of your health and your fitness, in addition to maintaining a really good relationship with your wife, in addition to just killing it with your job, you can reinforce that example with your children by also taking care of your appearance and your aesthetic. And they can see that dad knows how to be present when he's with us or when he goes on a date with mom or dad still has dignity and self-respect in that he, he gets dressed a certain way, not because anybody else makes him do it, but because He doesn't. It can be something as simple as jeans and a t-shirt, but when they fit well and they look like you wear them because you want to, as opposed to, you know, this is the t-shirt that the company that sponsored my work, my works 5k three years ago, I just still have that old t-shirt from that. It's a totally different thing that's, that's expressed. So I think that the aspirational fatherhood aspect is something that we, we absolutely have to be able to nail for our kids. I I think that's really, really important. And, uh, it it goes with owning who we are, Mm -hmm. right. And being confident with who we are. I want you to also talk about this perception of, and we see it in the fitness space quite a bit. Uh, it's like this, almost like this fit guilt and shame. Okay. Well, if I'm a fit dad, I'm going to come across as I'm completely and totally self-absorbed. I'm selfish. Mm -hmm. I'm arrogant. I'm this like a lot of guys do feel that way. Yeah. And they feel like, well, if I'm, if I'm a bit overweight, then I'm, I'm sending the message that it's not all about me. And it's about, it's about my family because I have bigger responsibilities now. Right. And, Which isn't that interesting that yeah. you will choose intentionally the aesthetic of being overweight. So you still care. You're very consciously choosing this aesthetic because of the signals that it sends to yourself and other people, which is that fatherhood is my top priority. And I'm willing to sacrifice myself on the altar of fatherhood, mm-hmm. but it still is it's not any more or less intentional of an aesthetic decision than, than trying to dress well or be in good shape. It's still very deliberate. I totally agree. And I, I always, I always challenge man. I was like, uh, you can actually have both, right. They're not mutually exclusive. They're not. And I was like, and I would argue that you can, and listen, I'm, I am not trying to, to draw a line in the sand of comparison of like, well, if you're an overweight father or husband, then you're not showing up. That is you're that just is a not, bad dad. No, of right. course not. It's not what I'm saying at all. In fact, like, listen, there, there are guys out there. Yeah. You, you show up, you do really, really well, despite physically where you're at. That's okay. Mm -hmm. What I am saying is, is in my personal experience, I'm speaking firsthand. I'm also speaking, you know, with my experience with other men who love fitness and do fitness. And what I can tell you is you can have both. Right. And, and I would definitely tell you that it's not selfish. It's selfless. I mean, I can, and I think you'll agree with me on this last point, which is if, if, you know, fitness is something that grounds you as an individual, it, you know, if it's therapeutic to you physically, mentally, emotionally, if it's a way for you to get your stress and frustrations out, so you're not taking them out on your kids. And plus, if you feel better, just in general, and I'm not talking about physically, I'm talking about mentally and emotionally, you feel better because I like to call like, Hey, when I go for a run or when I'm at a workout during a workout, sometimes I'm like, I'm working the demons out. Yeah. Like, hey, how, yeah. It's like, how was the workout? Great. I worked the demons out, you know, and yep. then I can show up feeling better for my family. But what I'll tell you is, is you're, you can have both. 
Yeah. And I would venture to say the same is for style. Yeah. 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 And it becomes the kind of thing that not only do you need to be able to give yourself permission for it, but then you end up giving your kids permission for it and creating a culture of that. I'll give you a good example of this related to fitness. If you guys watch any of my um, garage gym stuff on Instagram, you'll see along one of the walls, we have all of these race bibs and all of these medals. And I remember at one point, some guy, I uh, I made a post about like intentional fatherhood and investing time. And some guy jumps on in the comments and he's saying, well, clearly you're not very present with your kids. Look at all of this time that you put into the gym and look at all these races. And it's, it's like, okay, let's go through these two of those. Like that's me. That's my wife. That's me. That's my wife. That's my son. That's me and my wife. That's my kid. That's my kid. That's my kid. Like half of these bibs that are on here, these numbers aren't even mine. They belong to my wife or to my children because we have created a cult. And this is the reason why I have the gym in the garage is we have created a culture within the family that fitness is just part of being a guzzy that this is and my kids see me do it. They see my wife do it. And you can do the same thing with style where it's like, Oh, you're so vain. You're so vacuous. And it's like, no, it's, it's not that there's depth and there's surface. They're not mutually exclusive. And it becomes very natural and intuitive for my kids to be able to get dressed up for church and then actually find themselves entering a little bit of a different mindset because they're wearing different clothes than they do throughout the day or to feel like they're more ready to perform when they go to piano recital because they put on something that's different and it helps them be more present. And so I'm teaching them all of the power that their clothing can have and helping them learn to do this. And it's not at the expense of any of their depth. It's actually contributing to their depth. That is so cool, man. Contributing to their depth. I like that. Cool. Um, I want to talk about what are some other just misconceptions that as you work with new clients that come on board with you and start to work with you, what are some things you, you talk about how you inter, interweave personal development mm-hmm. along with expressing yourself through style. So I want to talk about that, but I also want to talk about with what are some of the perceptions that guys have about just their own style that we haven't talked about yet. So I think a couple of the biggest misperceptions are that you have to dress formally in order to be able to dress stylish and feel good about what you're wearing. The kind of assumption is, okay, so what Tanner's saying is I need to buy suits and I need to wear suits all the time, or I need to wear button ups and slacks. And that's not the case at all. I, I find myself in a suit once a week for church. And that's really about it. For the most part, I'm pretty casual. I'm in jeans and a Henley and a pair of sneakers, just like most other dads, but you do it again with higher quality materials and stuff that fits well. And you do it in a way that it looks well put together. And so you don't have to dress up more formally. Same thing with um, color or pattern. A lot of times guys think, okay, in order to change my style, I need to add in a bunch of different colors or I need to wear more bold patterns. And my color palette is actually pretty neutral. It's blue, brown, gray, and olive green. It's like 90% of what I wear. And so there's not a ton of color that has to be there either. Again, it's things like fit or the texture or the context of, of what you're what you're doing and where you find yourself. And then I would think the, I would say the last one is this idea of they say that they want to be comfortable and we kind of convince ourselves that we're talking about our physical comfort. But what we're really saying is I want the comfort of zero expectations. I don't want people to pay attention to me. I don't want people to notice me. Or if I do, I don't want them to expect something like leadership or the mastery or any sort of assertiveness or anything else. I want to be able to just fade into the background as much as I possibly can. And I get it because as men and as dads, we have a lot of responsibility and we have a lot of this burden of responsibility And you want to be able to come home and kind of let your hair down and not have to continue to shoulder that you want to be able to relax. And again, you can choose clothing that allows you to shift out of work mode into family mode, but still signals to you and to other people that I haven't just let myself go and don't bother me with any expectations or any responsibilities because I'm not in the position where I can handle them. You can still not be in work mode, be relaxed and still embrace being a dad and, and all of the burdens that come with that. Man, did you ever think I'm talking to the audience and you, did you ever think that you could be sending such a strong message just by your appearance? It's crazy, right? Yeah. It's crazy. But again, I mean, again, we get this on a subconscious level because you, you talk about your uniform and anybody who's ever had to earn the right to wear a uniform, whether that's in the armed services or a police force, or just to be part of like a high school sports team, 
you put that on and your mindset sh- mindset shifts. You go into game mode or you go into authority mode, you go into work mode and you do the same thing when you take it off. And, and so this idea of it doesn't matter, it doesn't affect me, I don't care is one of these really pretty lies we keep trying to tell ourselves and trying to convince ourselves of. But if you're honest enough with your self-evaluation, you'll realize that it has a massive impact on how you see yourself and how you feel when you're engaged in any sort of activity, again, try, try wearing a three piece suit to go work out. Even if it's like super stretch fabric and it doesn't physically impede you mentally, it's going to impede you because it's not what's appropriate for that context. Try wearing your ski clothes to go surfing. It's not going to work because of the mindset, just as much as the function that's going to be impeded there as well. And so embrace the fact that your clothing has a massive impact on how you see yourself and how you show up and how present you are and what it is that you're doing on a given day. Mm, I love that, man. So I would love for you to share with us maybe just what we would like to call like the next right thing or the simplest next things to do. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm your typical guy, dude. I hate shopping. Okay. Like I hate it. And, um, so I, and I think I told you at the live event, that I subscribe to Stitch Fix, mm-hmm. which is this, they pick out the clothes for you, which is a dream come true for me. Please don't let me shop. They all the clothes and colors right. and stuff run together and it's just overwhelming. They ship you things and you pick out what you want, send back what you don't want. And I told my, this company, send me any, send me, don't send me any crazy bright colors, but don't send me anything black. And they've been really, really good about sending me greens, you know, mm-hmm. olives, uh, browns, you know, that kind of thing. Yeah. But um, I would have never, I, I am your typical guy. Like I'm probably like 90% of my audience where I hate shopping. Mm-hmm. I hate shopping for myself. I mm-hmm. hate shopping for clothes. So if it wasn't for a service like Stitch Fix, I would still be lost. You'd still find me in Nordstrom's working, looking for the next black shirt. And Cause yeah. I still have no clue on how to do this by myself. So if, if a if typical guy in the audience, he's like, okay, like, what is the first thing I go do? What would you suggest? Okay. Let me ask you a follow-up question. Okay. This is good. It's going to get to my psyche. I can feel yes, it. Yes. Right. Let's do it. Yeah. Do you hate shopping because you're not good at it? I, I didn't know if there was an or in there. Uh, <laughs> I'm not good at it, man. I just okay, so that's what I perceive. Yeah. Think about it this way. Okay. If if you were to take my seven-year-old son and put him in either one of our positions right now and say, we're going to put you on a podcast, you're going to have thousands of men listen to you, and you need to be able to express yourself, he'd be pissed that I put him in this position because he doesn't have the language. He can't articulate himself. He doesn't have vocabulary. He doesn't have the grammar. He doesn't have the life experience to be able to take these ideas and put them into words, right? You and I love this. We, yeah. we, we made this a living, right? Like I, we love, we are so energized by getting to do, to do this stuff. And it's because the skill set is there. I would imagine for you, if you were to take, <laughs> we, 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 started playing this game. My, uh, my family picked up called uh, poetry for Neanderthals. It's kind of like charades, but instead of doing actions, you can only use monosyllabic words to try to get your team to guess what your, what your given word is. It's really challenging. And it's so funny to watch how frustrating it is for people because you all of a sudden take this entire skill set of being able to articulate yourself and you cut it off at the knees and they can't do it anymore. They can't use the, the words that they're used to or the language that they're used to. Clothing is just another method of communication. The reason you hate shopping is because you haven't established the right vocabulary. You haven't learned the grammar. You haven't learned the structure. If you were to take me and try to put me back into a a private school uniform, like what I used to wear, and not only limit what I wore, but even go so far as limit, no, you can't tie your tie that way, or no, you have to put your belt this exact way. I would feel so stifled and so frustrated because I wouldn't be able to be expressive. And so I would feel like what I was presenting to myself and to the rest of the world was a lie. So the first thing that I would say is change your mindset and start to think of shopping the same way that you think of speaking or writing. It's a skill set that anybody can develop. And the more you learn the rules and the more you develop that skill set, the more free you become in your ability to express yourself to be able to feel congruent with who you are, to be able to have the impact that you want on the world. And so learn to see it that way. Now, 
on the very basic baby steps, you know, my four-year-old daughter is learning Sam is a cat type of language, right? How to read and write those little things. This is where take what you're already doing. So a lot of guys, a lot of guys that are in your space, and I'm going to kill all your merch sales, but this is how it is for a lot of guys. We kind of overly rely on graphic t-shirts because it's this way to be able to project that I belong to this tribe or this is my identity. And basically it's almost this kind of like consumer thing of my identity is rooted in my consumption of this podcast or my affinity with this group or, you know, my fandom of this band or whatever else. Take jeans and t-shirts and sneakers, get rid of the graphic ones, take whatever jeans you're wearing. And either if you're wearing hyper skinny stuff, because that's when you grew up and the trend was that way 10 years ago, let them loosen out a little bit. Or if you're still wearing like the super old stuff that you and I grew up with in like the late nineties, early two thousands, really baggy stuff, which honestly, I don't know where you guys even find that stuff anymore. I just assume these are the same jeans you've literally owned for the last 18 years because you can't even go buy it. Tighten those up a little bit. You don't have to go skinny. You don't have to go hipster, but just tighten up your fit a little bit. Same thing with your sneakers. Don't wear things that are supposed to be in the gym, but get some good classic sneakers or something like Adidas Stan Smith's or a pair of like Nike Internationalists or New Balance 247, something that is going to be kind of a classic in a sneaker, but it's not going to look like it's a dad thing. It's also not going to look like it's on its way to the gym. You just make those little tweaks. That's the equivalent of I am Sam, Sam as a cat, like learning this basic language skills and watch as you feel different when you see yourself because you're no longer just a mannequin for the dad edge or for that band or for something else, but it becomes that your clothing is now supplementing you and you will start to see yourself as a more fully fleshed out and a more individualized man, as opposed to a product of whatever the different things are that you consume. That makes things so simple, right? Right? Like without overthinking it. So it's like, okay, take the jeans that I'm currently wearing, making sure, make sure that they fit properly. Cause I do think that's a big one. A A lot of guys like to wear jeans that are too big. Yeah. They're too long. They're too baggy. They wear them super low down on their, on their hips and just change that. And it changes everything. Right. And the other thing too is, yeah, have your gym shoes and then have your shoes that you wear with jeans and that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Um, I also want to get to this other thing too, because I'm sure it's a, it's a psychological thing for guys and I'm sure it's probably been brought up to you. And it's probably this thing of like, well, if I dress this way, other people aren't used to it and they're going to start being weird or like, so for instance, if I were, I've known my in-laws for, you know, 25 years now, mm-hmm. been married to Jessica for 19. And if I suddenly just a flip of a switch changed my style, I guarantee that I would get a comment or two like, Whoa, totally. like, uh, what's, what's up with, what are you dressed up for? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, and I, I, I do think, and I'm, I'm just guessing here, you, again, you know more than I do that that's gotta be a legitimate fear for people. Totally. It's totally valid. Yeah. yeah. Because again, you're drawing attention to yourself that you're yeah. not used to having. And not only that, but it's attention that can go negative. Style is really hard in that. Okay. I'm learning to play the cello. And one of the nice things about learning to play the cello is that I do it in our music room and it's only my wife and my kids that hear me. I can't imagine having the willpower, the discipline to practice playing the cello. If I were doing it on Instagram live every day, where it's in front of thousands of people and they're watching me screw up and they're watching me learn as I go style. You don't get the luxury of practicing that in public. You buy something new and you don't really find out if it does or it doesn't work until you're out and wearing it with your in-laws or at work or in some other environment. So it's a legitimate fear because you're trying to establish a skill set that you don't have. And then in addition to that, We want people to see us as consistent. We value congruence and consistency and that we're stalwart and that we're we're all of this. And so again, making those little changes, you just ditch the graphic tees for solid t-shirts. It's not going to be a big enough difference that anybody's really going to notice and start to draw attention to that. Or you take the zip up hoodie and instead you do something like a field jacket, like an old vintage military field jacket. It's not this thing that it's like, oh, well, now he's wearing a sport coat because he's all fancy and he thinks, you know, like it's just these little subtle changes so that it doesn't draw too much attention, but it gives you more space to start to explore and experiment within. So totally valid concern and just take those baby steps. I I love how simple you make this. I want to talk also about, so we've talked about jeans, talked about shoes. I do want to talk about shirts. Okay. And I know this sounds so basic, but, but shirts and, mm-hmm. 
and maybe some, some just different ideas that could go along with shirts. And let's also maybe talk about the perception. We've already talked about perception of like, well, if I'm dressing different, am I basically, am I demonstrating to the people that I love in the rest of the world that it's all about me and I'm arrogant now mm-hmm. and I want people and I'm dressing stylish because I want attention. And I, I would almost guarantee that that's not the case. In fact, it's right. probably for a lot of guys be like, no, I really don't want the attention. Right. However, I, I, I do appreciate good style. The other perception is, is, well, if I dress in a certain way, people that are really close to me might start questioning what I'm doing, which is going to make me feel kind of weird. So we've already mm-hmm. talked about that one. But this last perception that I'm guessing that you have probably heard a time or two is, well, if I'm dressing more stylish, like let's just take a, um, a guy who wears like, so for instance, I used to wear large because to be mm-hmm. honest, I thought I wore the size large. Turns out yeah. I would swim in a large, but I always thought that that was, and then I went to a medium. I'm like, I'm actually a medium. Amazing. Yeah. It's like, and these yeah. shirts, they fit better and all this other stuff. Um, but some guys, I think they're like, okay, well, if I'm dressing different and I'm dressing more stylish, does it look like now that I'm trying too hard mm-hmm. or does it look like I'm having like this midlife crisis and suddenly I'm doing this for, for these particular type of reasons. But if we were to, if you could address once one piece of advice for style for the upper body mm-hmm. and also addressing maybe that perception as well. Okay. Yeah, this is again where you look at some of these other misconceptions as far as I have to dress up more formally or I have to introduce a ton of pattern or a ton of different colors because that does become, okay, let's think about it as a spectrum where most guys are in the, please don't pay attention to me, don't notice me, I just want to blend in. I just don't want to dress so poorly that I look like an idiot kind of face, right? And then we want to avoid, and there are plenty of guys that are like this, you you rightfully fear this because we see examples of this as, I am so desperate for attention that I will dress in the most garish, flamboyant, crazy attention seeking way that I can. And I demand that everybody notice me. And those are the guys that often do end up looking like they're trying too hard. The sweet spot for most guys is I don't need your attention. However, I'm comfortable with you paying attention to me. I neither need to court it, nor do I need to avoid it. And that's that very kind of comfortable range if you can fit anywhere within the full spectrum. That's where that's what your appearance for the most part should evoke is that. It's not I'm trying to blend in, nor that I'm desperately trying to stand out. So a really good example of this coming back to shirts. So let's say whether it's a t-shirt, a polo, a casual button-up shirt, a dress button-up shirt, again, stick with simple colors, black, white, blue, brown, gray, something like that. Have it so that it fits relatively snug in the sleeves, in the chest, in the shoulders, and in the traps, but then it has a little bit of drape down through the stomach. And the reason for that is because one, it kind of gives this V taper of, look, my muscles are so big that I can fill it out in the right spaces, but I'm also trim enough, even if you're not, because if you've got a little bit of a belly, it hides it, or if you've got abs and it actually doesn't make you look one-dimensionally like you're seeking attention because it's saran wrapped on you. So it helps kind of give more of that multidimensionality. I've got more going on for me than just my abs. If there's a little bit of that drape down through the waist and the, and the seat with it. But again, if it's a white shirt or a gray shirt or a Navy shirt, you see somebody wearing that and you're not going, Oh, that guy's trying way too hard, especially if it's not hyper skinny or really overly baggy, you're just going to see it. And you almost kind of just, move past the clothes and you see the man that's wearing the clothes instead. And that's again, where most guys would want to be is you don't want to be a mannequin to show off what your clothing is. You want your clothing to be the frame that shows you and you're kind of the main photo, the main centerpiece and and all of that. So stick with those neutrals, get the fit dialed with the whole thing. And again, you get the shirt dialed, you get the pants dialed, you get the shoes dialed. Nothing about it is going to be super memorable but it's also going to look like you don't care if people pay, you're comfortable with people paying attention to you too. That's cool, man. I, w- I want to also talk about anything that we haven't talked about. So again, this is like, I'm, I'm about as green as, and I don't mean the color, about as green as green can get when it comes <laughs> to this kind of thing. So I've only made assumptions on some of the mm-hmm. experiences that you've had and some of the things that rattle in, in a man's mind. What haven't we talked about? Um, one thing that I see fairly frequently is, A lot of times guys will feel like, okay, I can do all this. I can do it at work. I can do it when I go out with my wife, but 
I don't want to have to think about what I wear when I'm in the gym or when I'm out camping or when I'm doing yard work. I don't want to have to think about my style in that context. And what I would say even to that is find something that one kind of helps you be present in whatever activities that you're doing from a physical standpoint, that it gets the job done. But then two, from a mental and emotional standpoint, it helps get you present. You want your gym clothes. And I'm even kind of like hyper specific to this where the clothes that I lift in are different than the clothes that I run in because my mindset is different when I'm lifting than it is when I'm running. And so you can almost kind of key into it that way. But what you want to avoid and what a lot of guys do is they feel like, okay, I have to dress up. I have being stylish means dressing up. It means exerting effort. And when I'm in my pajamas on a Sunday morning or when I'm going to the gym, I don't want to have to think about what I'm wearing. And what that subtly reinforces in your head is that anytime you look good, it's a mask that you're putting on for somebody else. And anytime that you look sloppy or that you look just kind of like you haven't thought about it at all, that's the real you. And so it actually creates more of this dissonance with your style. You start to resent it. Whereas if you get to the point where you don't own anything that's crappy, and I mean, I wear sweat shorts and t-shirts, but again, simple colors and they fit well. That's what I wear on a Sunday morning. It does. I'm not dressed up, but I don't own anything that if I had a client or the president or somebody else come over to me when I'm in the gym or when I'm lounging at my house on a Sunday morning, they would go, oh, this guy's a hypocrite because he talks a big game about his style, but he's jumped off the deep end on this. And it's not because those people are ever going to come, but it's because what it does for me is it means that this now is an, an integral part of who I am. I've got my integrity in that style is not a mask I put on in a certain environment or for other people. This is who I am through and through. I'm a man with dignity. I'm a man with self-respect. I'm a man who values and appreciates beauty. And that, when you internalize that, makes it so you feel that much more authentic and you feel that much more confident even when you do get dressed up, let alone when you're totally dressed down. So cool, man. This is uh, this has been absolutely awesome, man. It's uh, fun. It's fun it to is. think about, isn't it? Well, it, I think it's fun to think about as long as we have somebody like you that <laughs> guides us to think about it in the right way versus, I mean, is it safe to say that there, that our subconscious is in the driver's seat when it comes to our style a lot? Not only our subconscious, but also so much of our, of our culture, which again tells us, oh, you care about this stuff, you're vain, you're shallow, you're superficial, you're feminine, you're gay, you're whatever else. And so there's all these things that have, you almost kind of have to wonder if there's this like evil cabal that's trying to psy up men into not caring about our appearance because there's some real power that we haven't tapped into with it but there's so much working against our caring about it and you're right when you have somebody that can kind of guide you through it and you realize the real power that comes from it it does it becomes very fun that's so cool man i want to make sure all the guys can find you i mean if if i mean the lowest hanging fruit by far is following you on instagram it's, mm -hmm. it's so cool. Like I just, I love your content. I guess IG knows that I love your content because it always pops up first or second thing on my Sweet. feed. I'm flattered by that. <laughs> yeah, man. Uh, but where, where else can guys find you if they want more information and they just want to connect with you? Yeah. So on social media, I'm most active on Twitter and Instagram. Both of those are at Tanner Guzzi. And what you guys will find is um, it's about 20% style content. And the rest of it is the stuff that you guys do. It's fatherhood, it's masculinity, it's marriage, it's faith. It's all the things that actually matter so much more, but then your style can be, be part of that. So yeah, those are the two most active social media platforms. Uh, you can go to masculine-style.com and learn more about what my coaching looks like, uh, get signed up for the newsletter, learn more about things a little bit in depth that way. And then also if you're a reader. Um, I published a book called The Appearance of Power. Uh, and you can find that on Amazon and then the Audible and all that and really kind of take a good deep dive about the historic and cultural philosophical significance of why men have always used appearance, whether that's the ancient Spartans to uh, the chemise, which was the dueling scar that got the German students had in like the early 20th century and kind of everything in between and why men have always cared about our appearance. So you can go check out The Appearance of Power. Oh, guys, well, not to worry, man. We're going to have all the links in the show notes for Tanner. All you have to do is go to thedadedge.com forward slash Friday 49 for this show. Again, thedadedge.com forward slash Friday 49. Uh, Tanner, this this was, uh, from, I'm sure the audience can can feel it, but I had a, a smile on my face almost from ear to ear just because I it this this fascinates me now. It's something I used to ignore, but I'm fascinated by it because I think I'm excited because I now, I now understand it. And uh, this has been, this has been a huge learning opportunity. So thank you for coming on. 
Thank you for having me, man. It's so like I get chills just thinking about getting to break open brains and shift paradigms. And so to get to do it with you in real time and watch you open up. And I felt this way when we were doing our conversation where you came back after we had our first conversation that night and came back to talk more. It's like, I got him. I got him. He gets it now. And it's so fun to get to see that happen. So I love that we're friends and we get to keep doing this conversation offline too. I'm excited to see how your style evolves, man. Thanks, man. I appreciate that. Gentlemen, like I said, go connect with Tanner. You obviously you can tell he's got a heart of gold. Uh, he he knows the deep psychological reasons we dress the way we do, perceive ourselves the way we do, all these things. And um, he, he's just a good man. Like I said, head on over to the dadedge.com forward slash Friday four nine. And gentlemen, as always, go out, live legendary, because legacy is forever. Take care, guys. <laughs>